and everybody in. Okay. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the November already. I can't believe I'm saying that, but the November 2021 District 3 Community Meeting. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, especially a week early. I know this is a little bit different than we normally do it. Normally, my meetings are always in the third week of the month, either on a Thursday or a Saturday, but uh, I have a COG board meeting next Thursday and a soccer game for my daughter next Saturday. And so um, not to say the residents don't come first, but uh, but the COG meeting and my daughter comes first this month. So uh, with that said, uh, I was able to throw together and I want to thank everybody uh, who is a panelist tonight. Um, I threw this meeting together really quick and it's uh, I, I'm actually surprised at myself for not having hosted a topic on this earlier. We've we've had meetings every year on traffic and and whatnot, but we've never really uh, gotten in the weeds on um micro mobility or mobility without a car, right? Uh, so talking about bikes or, or slow speed vehicles or whatnot. And, uh, and we should, because it's been uh, an area that I have been uh, focused on and maybe not focused on enough, but, um, but an area that I, I really truly believe in, uh, especially after having lived for uh, a summer in, um, uh, in Europe, in Copenhagen specifically, and, uh, you know, seeing a, a city that is rich with history and has been around for centuries and yet is uh, also the second largest biking uh, community in, in Europe right now. I think it's second to uh, Amsterdam. And, and what amazes me there is, uh, is that, like I said, the infrastructure has been there. The streets, the buildings, they've been there for far longer than I think we've even been here as a country, but they've figured out a way to make it happen. And furthermore, uh, Copenhagen is uh, is very far up in the Northern Hemisphere. So they, they experience a lot of light in the summers uh, and springs, and they experience a lot of dark, you know, in the winters. But people, st and snow, clearly, and people use bikes there regardless uh, of of the uh, the winter weather. Uh, it, it, hundreds of thousands of people are biking, and now granted, they do have much better public transportation and buses and and trains. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that if they can do it in a European city, why doesn't a beach city in California with a temperate climate? Why haven't we figured this out yet? And why are people so resistant to changing our roads to accommodate safe lanes for cyclists uh, or slow speed vehicles, uh, whatever they may be, skateboards, scooters, it, it doesn't really matter. The, the simple fact of the matter is from my perspective, during the past year or year and a half of COVID, uh, especially when we were in true lockdown last year, it was beautiful to see how many residents were walking uh, in the neighborhood, not just alone, families, full entire families walking together or biking. Um, it, I mean, the streets were definitely quieter than normal, uh, but people were using the streets in a much different way. And, and I think in a way that, that we really should be considering, especially as we think about the quality of life we have here in a beach community. And, and, and I wanna extrapolate that out to, it shouldn't just be Redondo, right? It should be all our connected communities because we are so connected here in the South Bay between uh, the, the four beach cities or Torrance, Lawndale. Uh, we, we literally um, interweave with each other on a daily basis, whether we are commuting, uh, taking our kids to school. Um, it doesn't matter. Simple fact is that we have opportunities to get around and we have uh, the opportunity to get around in some cases without a vehicle. And um, it should be noted, uh, you know, this was told to me when I first came on the council back in 2015, 30% of our morning and our uh, afternoon traffic is caused by individuals just taking their kids to and from school. Uh, and now I am one of those parents because my daughter goes to Da Vinci Design in El Segundo. Um, so uh, th that's an amazing thing to think about, especially here in Redondo, where all the elementary schools are within walking distance of, of homes. Uh, the middle schools and the high school, uh, maybe not as much, but 
Uh, but what if? You know, that's that's really the question I think we're going to pose tonight as we as we hear from our three presenters is what if and how. So with that said, uh, my my first uh, presenter tonight is a Redondo Beach resident, very actively engaged uh, in uh, the League of Women Voters, uh, quite a scientific thinker. Uh, and I always appreciate her perspective. She has a very small time window uh, with us tonight, and so she's going to take about 10 minutes and and really get into safety and some other things that she's been doing uh, on her own. And then uh, my second speaker will be Aaron Baum. He is uh, one of our analysts, and that's probably not his correct title, at the South Bay City Council of Governments, but he does focus uh, primarily on... Um, on innovative transportation areas as well as technology and probably more and we'll let Aaron uh, give himself a quick bio and then finally our, our third speaker uh, tonight is Jim Hannon who uh, is not only a, a resident here in Redondo Beach but has uh, probably been one of the most vocal advocates for biking uh, for the better part of uh, at least the past 10 years, if not more. Um, so with that said, Grace, I'm going to kick it over to you, and why don't you uh, start with your presentation? Okay, can you see my screen, Data Driven Climate Action? Yes. Okay, so I just found out a couple days ago that I had this opportunity, and I didn't have time to pull together slides. So I, um, so I just did a mishmash of slides from prior talks. Um, a little bit about myself. I have degrees in math, chemistry, and physics, and I work primarily in weather and climate data collection and um, dissemination to help people make decisions, whether it's military or government or industry. And uh, so I'm primarily a scientist, and I've been riding my bicycle everywhere since the since like 1988 when I was a graduate student and worried about climate change because I knew that cars are the reason why we're destroying the planet, um, both in a local sense. It's our lar cars are our largest polluter of air, water, and soil in LA County. And they are also the primary, uh, the primary source of our emissions. So this is our emissions in LA County and transportation sector is 42% of which three quarters of it is cars. And then if you count, um, if you count like the oil refineries and the pipelines and stuff like that, transportation emissions are like half of our emissions. And here's the California, and so here's the California, um, these are the California numbers, they're very similar. Cars, um, cars are about half at four. Transportation is about half our emissions, cars are like two-thirds to three-quarters of those emissions. And this is our carbon budget in order to have, like, a, to avoid catastrophic climate change. And you'll see, you know, that you'll see that the time, the best time to take action would have been, like, around 1980, 1990. And we just kept, we just kept using up our CO2 emissions uh, budget. And so now we're really in a hole. We have to drive down our carbon emissions really, really fast because we delayed action for so long. And, you know, we don't have to wait for electric cars because even if 100% of the electric cars sold today were, uh, even if 100% of the cars sold today were electric, you know, because they last so long, in uh, by 2030, like only half of our cars would be electric. And that's just not enough because electric cars only reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions by 30 to 70 percent based on the electricity that you source that you use. But e-bikes are available now. And not only that, the charging infrastructure is already available. And remember, we want, you know, we want to move people, not cars, because it's people that create our society, they create our economy. Moving people should be our goal, not moving cars. And basically, we have designed our streets for the most inefficient, space inefficient method. And we're a dense suburb and uh, e-bikes could really, e-bikes and using transit for our longer trips and e-bikes or e micro mobility, you know, that could go a long way for us. That, that could basically solve most of our pollution and parking and traffic problems. And remind you that people People drive our economy, and um, the, 
South Bay um, Cog has done some wonderful reports about how dependent our local businesses are on people who live a very short distance from them. And that's easily doable by micro mobility if we gave them a safe way to do this. So, and like people, the, I hear people get very upset. They don't want more people in the South Bay, but what I hear, that's what they say, but what really they don't want is they don't want more pollution and they don't want more traffic. And and that's cars, not people. So road noise increases with speed and vehicle size. And there are ways that we can get around that. And remember, like tire dust is is microplastics. It washes into our coastal waters. It's very bad for um, the marine life that we all treasure and the brake dust and, and tire dust and the um the asphalt dust that heavy cars create that's that's making us all sick so um heavier vehicles including electric cars are very heavy because batteries are heavy they're not the answer i mean we we need to get people out of cars as much as possible and then electrify the rest so, and parking, 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 everyone talks about parking and car storage. But um, I want to emphasize that bicycling is for all ages. This is my friend Kate. She's another, a fellow math major. And it just so happened she married a guy and moved to the Netherlands. And she and all the, all the Dutch moms drive their kids around in these cargo wagons. And it's just adorable. And you should see, like, she goes to Mommy and Me. I go to Mommy and Me Yoga, and there's six SUVs lined up. She goes to Mommy and Me Yoga, and there are six cargo e-wagons lined up. Now, this is something we can do today, here. Um, and this this is the Limerick Rolling School Bus. Um, and this is Olivia de Havilland in her 20s or maybe early 30s um, riding around the... Um, their Paramount lot, and here she is at a hundred riding her car, um, her tricycle. She's she was bicycling basically for um, you know like ninety five years of her life. It's doable if you. The problem is if you ever stop cycling, then you're toast. And so I took a um, I took a series of classes in geographic information systems through UC San Diego, and I studied my community for for my independent study project. So for GIS four, I studied um, mobility of senior senior mobility needs in my community, and so that's a talk I can give at, at later. Day. And then for GIS five, I studied uh, school children because those are our most vulnerable people. And uh, so this is all the ways that we're not living up to our um, professed values. And these are our existing bike lanes. And you'll notice that they're not really connected to anything. They're not useful yet, but this is what the LTN is trying to solve, to, so trying to address. So um, anyway, obstructions. So if you're unable to drive and you have to walk or if you're in a, mo uh, in a wheelchair or something like that, what do you do when you're on a sidewalk and you face this? Yeah, I did a walk on it. I did a walk on it, of the, and we have obstruct we have obstructed and narrow sidewalks everywhere. So we're not theoretically we're connected, but we're not. And then you've got like these really wide intersections, like here at Artesia and Aviation, that they're already wide, but we're about to widen them an additional um, ten feet to add another lane. So um, what happens is it. These are times so that a healthy person that can walk 1.3 meters um, per, per second can cross the street in time. However, we know that seniors walk, as independent seniors walk about 1 meter, 0.9 meters a second. So that means that seniors cannot cross these streets, and they're effectively mo um, moated. These wide arterials are basically moats for them, and they can't go anywhere. And... So I did, so I, you know, I was learning ArcGIS, and so I just did a, a walk shed analysis, and I put in real barriers where, like, if you cannot walk across this intersection, if you can't cross this intersection, then you basically cut a whole quadrant out of what a senior living at the Montecito um, can reach. That means that they cannot reach... The, they can't reach um, Miracosta Pool or Beg Pool where um, they they hold the senior aqua aerobics classes. And um, a hostile by design, Artesia and PCH 
is a uh, design disaster because in order to facilitate the right turn, you've taken out the sidewalk here. So if Miracosta High School is right here on the upper right, and so if you live just across the street, you have to go, um, you have to make a three-legged run to go to the school. You have to make a three-legged run. You have to go 140 meters just to cross PCH to get to school. And that, and I've actually gone out there and observed how people use that intersection. I see a lot of unsafe behaviors because of this three-legged crossing. People come down here and then they just keep going like this down the hill on their bikes and stuff. So you really have to like go out and do field studies to understand the behaviors. So anyway, and then we have the potential green line station and we have 40 at five to 70 meter crossings and they're just not doable. If, unless you're super quick, they're just not doable. And we can do better intersections like Santa Monica is rolling out better intersections. And you see these little, do you see these little cushions right here? And it forces the cars to take tighter turns and slow down more. So, and that makes it, easier um, for bicyclists to cross and, and pedestrian leading um, light interval lights that like Manhattan Beach is rolling out those would be really helpful and you know the 85 percent rule has just turned our streets into killing fields speed kills we've got in front of Miracosta High School it's 40 miles per hour until you get within half a block of the school no wonder mm -hmm. this the kids are riding on the sidewalks if they're riding at all and um, I don't blame them. We can do better. We need to do better. And so, uh, and seniors are especially vulnerable if they get hit. Like, if I'm like a healthy middle-aged person, I could survive getting hit. I would be maimed for life, but I would survive. But a six-year-old would be killed. And t taller vehicles kill. You know, in the beach cities, people love giant cars. And I've been hit by an SUV that couldn't see me because I was right in front of his bumper. So, um we have to disinvent, disincentivize people driving tall vehicles because they're killing people or they're suppressing, they're forcing me into a car to do something that I could have done by bike. Even though I know it's polluting and I feel horribly guilty, I want to get at my destination alive. And like, this is legal. We, in Redondo Beach, we let people jack up their vehicles, park them on the street. Notice that there, there, there are winch hooks uh, along here. This is a major reason why so many kids are getting killed on the streets. These winch hooks, they grab on, um, and brush guards, they grab on to children's backpacks and throw children under the car wheels. This is, um, this is a major reason why cars are, the, uh, cars are the biggest killers of children in the United States. And we allow people to do this and park on our streets. And then this just ruins the sight lines. This is um, opposite corners of the same thing. So how many times have we heard, oh, they just jumped out of nowhere? Well, they jumped out of nowhere because you can't see them because there are cars, really tall cars blocking the sight lines. And here they are at, a, um, at another intersection. And these are cars that are legally parked, but maybe we should change our parking laws. And uh, so, so I also did studies about like how seniors would reach certain destinations and how far they have to go because we don't provide safe infrastructure. So like right now, if we wanted to get between North Redondo Beach Library and Miracosa, and we could have difficulty crossing this intersection, we'd have to go all the way around here. And if we had provided a, um, a traffic light at Voorhees Avenue, like we had promised, because it's part of our uh, original South Bay Bicycle Master Plan in 2011, if we had provided a safe bicycle pedestrian crossing here, they, this would have been a shorter path. But we didn't. And this, if you could run across an arterial, if you could, anyway, we are not doing what we need to do to protect our most vulnerable road users. I can give a much longer talk. But um, so I have recommendations and then I talk with, this is why we want to um, do bikeways and do, 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 do. And I'm running out of time. I've done literature surveys. I'm all about the data. Here's the bibliography, great articles. Um, I can forward it to you if you want, but it shows that if you install, um, if you install safer bicycling infrastructure, um, the, um, the, amount of injuries and deaths on your roadways for all modal users, 
whether they're pedestrians, cyclists, or automobile users, everyone is safer. Everyone is safer if you install safe, supportive bicycle infrastructure. And then Fair, uh, Fair and Track and Marshall, they're um, like, I'm just a total fangirl of these uh, two researchers. They quantified suppressed child pedestrian and bicycle trips, looking at um, like sidewalk connectivity and how, um, and how heavy the traffic is. And they were able to predict how many more children would be walking or bicycling to school if you did certain interventions. Anyway, so key actions to do around here. Take advantage of the new laws that we just passed, lower speed limits today. Don't wait for a five-year traffic study. Do it today because lives are on the line and the planet is on the line. And you have to protect vulnerable pedestrians and cyclists through the intersections. Like I, right now, I'm seeing the bike lanes just disappear through the intersection because, because we're not willing to do what it takes to um, help people across that barrier, that moat. And, you know, I... It gets dark in the winter, and if I go someplace and I want to come home after dark, I'm going to drive. And that shouldn't, we need to make it supportive so that we can use it after dark. And we've had, like, we've had two um, essential workers die on Rosecrans commuting and by, and killed by motorists that claim they didn't see them. So we really need to do something about that, protect sight lines and nudge people to smaller, lighter cars. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. I'm sorry that you have to rush through that tonight, but, uh, but you know, we will just have to have you back and have a, a broader conversation too around uh, safety uh, sometime soon. So, um, and I'd love to show you my data for around schools because that's something that when people talk about cars lasting 15 years, well, people like, like Olivia de Havilland, she was like alive and kicking until she was 102. So we, so people travel longer than a, an individual car. So the fact, the the habits, the mobility habits that people build in uh, in childhood last a lifetime, and they're much more impactful than replacing a gasoline car with an electric car. Well, I, I completely agree. And I think, uh, you know, the Streets for All program that we created, it kind of took a, uh, a little bit of a dip, clearly because of COVID and stuff. But we were starting to talk about, you know, what's the next phase to do with that program? And it has a lot to do with education. And I think uh, we can continue this conversation offline and with Jim, actually, about how to uh, how to continue to educate and uh, and have those conversations with the health district, with the school district, and with the Redondo Beach Police Department. Right. So, are, are you is that part of Streets for All, Michael Schneider's organization? No. So we uh, we named it Streets for All, but this was uh, an idea I came up with in my first year of office, based on uh, talking to residents when I was canvassing neighborhoods. And, uh, and so I brought together the school district, the health district, and the PD, and, uh, and the health district put together this program. They called it Streets for All, but there are other programs called Streets for All uh, around. And, uh, and they used a lot, of, um, a lot of info from, like, the Go Human campaign that SCAG was doing. Uh, so, but, you know, the, the, the point of it was that, uh, as we've talked about here many times, traffic is a three-legged stool, right? It's... Uh, there's the infrastructure, um, there is the enforcement, and, and then there's the educational component. And we, you know, we haven't really focused on that. If we want people, we, you know, we could build infrastructure to get people to slow down, or we could educate people about the importance to the point of your one slide, right? That uh, just, you know, a five mile per hour difference in speed has a dramatic impact on on if somebody was to get hit by a vehicle. So, um, so, and to your point, you are right. A state law did just pass, uh, that was, uh, brought by, uh, Assemblywoman Laura Friedman that gives cities now, uh, the, uh, a greater ability to lower the speed limits, um, without having to follow the 85th percentile rule that we do. And so, uh, we supported that as a city council and I've already made a referral to, uh, to now bring back a conversation about how can we enact slower speeds in residential areas? You know, going, the simple fact of the matter is going from 25 to 20 in our residential areas is not gonna have that much of an impact on your ability to get somewhere, but it will have a dramatic impact on 
how safe how much safer the streets can feel and with the amount of stop signs we have in redondo beach you really can't get from one block to the other uh you know, by, by the time you hit 25, you are already breaking to hit the next stop sign. So uh, it makes sense for us to, to use proactive measures to keep everybody safe, you know, whether you're in a vehicle or you're a pedestrian or you are a, uh, a user of multimodal means. So uh, Grace, thanks so much for coming on and, and blasting through your presentation. Um, if you want, put a link to it in the uh, chat box. And then, like I said, I will also put it up on uh, my website and make sure that we get it out to people so that they can, uh, they can see it as well. Mark. And then I have specific ones for focusing on seniors and on school kids. Great. Too. So um, I'm with the League of Women Voters, and we do a lot of edu public education. I'm about to start one at 7 o'clock on water. <laughs> so, so if you want the League of Women Voters Beach Cities to do a longer thing about this, just give us a shout out. I'm going to give my um, email address in the chat box, and you can email me um, if you want my slides or if you want information about joining us for one of our education things. You don't have to be a member to go to our public education events, but we do hope you do join. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, so next up uh, is Aaron Baum from uh, the South Bay Cities Council of Government. So Aaron, why don't you uh, just give a, a quick little uh, spiel on, on who you are and what you do there, and then uh, you can talk about uh, the local travel network, which is a... Uh, uh, a new way to also look at helping people get around. Thank you, Council Member Horvath, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak with you, your constituents, and, and the other folks who are online with us today. Uh, first, uh, just a big shout out to Grace. You are uh, extraordinarily fortunate to have someone like that in your community. She is a, a dynamo, to say the least. Um, behind all the good things she said is a lot of great information, and she just literally, like you said, she blasted through it. So. I encourage all of you who are interested to reach out to Grace and maybe have her back another time. There, there's good stuff behind all that, and if she, you know, and you'll be able to sort of unpack some of that for for uh, future business and for future opportunities for the city of Redondo Beach and our community at large. I am, as you said, a sort of a jack of all trades of sorts at the at the South Bay Cities Council of Governments. I specialize in mobility, technology, and transportation. Um, opportunities. I'm a program manager by title and somebody who has been working this space for a long, long time, as you can see by my gray hair or, and lack thereof. Um, and I'm happy to share my presentation with you right now to talk to you all about uh, the work we've been doing at the uh, South Bay City Council of Governments with regard to uh, mobility and uh, in particular micro mobility, uh, which sort of rolls up into things that Grace was talking about and what Jim will be talking about shortly. Uh, so first of all, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Is that a, that a yes? Okay, fantastic. Uh, so uh, the, the presentation I'm going to make tonight is on what we call the local travel network or the LTN and micromobility. And again, I thank you for the opportunity to reach out to your constituents and through this, uh, this forum. Um, I always like to start out with uh, who we are. Um, everyone knows who uh, Council Member uh, Horbath is, um, but he, uh, he has served uh, diligently and with, and with great uh, effect and import uh, in our uh, Council of Governments. We work on behalf of the 15 cities in the South Bay. Uh, we are a planning agency and we advocate for the cities. We create capacity for them. We do all kinds of planning and research for our cities. Uh, Christian served as a uh, as our chair. I guess it's, my mind's a blur. I think it was last year. Two uh, years ago. If I'm not mistaken. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> kind of, yes. So and, and served with great distinction. And we got a lot done during his tenure, um, including the project we're working on and, and also on, on the fast speed side, the South Bay Fiber Network. So uh, some great stuff is going on, and we're going to talk a little bit about the slow side of it and the infrastructure for micromobility today. Uh, our agency has done a lot of work, and our, our sort of core mission, if you will, on behalf of the cities has to do with uh, climate action planning, uh, all things sustainable. 
uh, the, the area of work that concerns what we're talking about tonight has to do with transportation. Grace hit it right on the head. Uh, transportation is the largest uh, uh, emitter of greenhouse gas emissions in the state of California and, and by extension also here locally. And if we can do anything in this world to make our climate and our communities a little greener, a little more sustainable, it has to do with addressing the issues around mobility. Uh, the, the COG, as we like to call our agency, uh, has done a lot of research in this field. It's almost 10 years worth of research now, uh, including a, a pilot study on neighborhood electric vehicles, the golf carts. And what you see the picture on the right is a little sort of golf cart-like vehicle. You see these all across the communities and the beach cities in particular, um, and they're called uh, neighborhood electric vehicles or golf carts. Uh, but it also, this, this sort of area is also referred to in terms of micromobility. We'll get into that in just a second. So again, if we can address mobility, we can have a, sub a substantial um, impact in terms of sustainability um, and lowering greenhouse gas emissions and making our, our communities uh, greener and, and and, and healthier all across the board. And that's what our agency is all about. What we've learned, so we've done a lot of research and, and as Grace sort of quickly referred to uh, uh, and, and I can speak factually about it, um, most trips are very local, okay? You get in your car and you don't go very far. Now you may have a long commute to work if you live and work in the city of Los Angeles or maybe you commute other places in, in the South Bay, uh, but for the most part, all of our trips, 7%, are under three miles. So what kind of trips are they? They're pickups and drop-offs to our kids at school. They're going to the local grocery store. They're going to parks. They're going to you know, areas of interest or concern in our, in our communities. Um, and so at the COG, we see this as an opportunity to have great impact in terms of sustainability. Can we right-size the vehicles to address those short trips. You know, Grace made a point about accidents and you know, larger vehicles, more, more opportunities for death and destruction and mayhem and such. Well, really that's, that's about right-sizing the car. You don't need a big SUV to get you to a local grocery store. Maybe you need a golf cart. Maybe that might be the right, you know, right sizing of your trip. Um, now, if it's a zero emission vehicle, well, bingo, you've hit the nail on the head in terms of lowering your greenhouse, your, your carbon footprint here in the South Bay. Now, the, 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 you know, the, the universe of these vehicles is growing even as we speak, okay? And this picture kind of represents uh, a, a, you know, the cross-section of what, what, what's out there. Grace had another really cool one with, the, you know, with um, Olivia de Havilland riding a bicycle and such. Uh, this, again, speaks to that. Um, down here in the left corner is a golf cart. Uh, you, you know, you have a, an intrepid person on a, uni, a unicycle or a uniboard. These things are like segways, so they balance themselves. Uh, you have uh, somebody on a, 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 tri, a tri-wheeler, um, electric power assist, an e-bike, an e-skateboard, even personal s scooters. Uh, so this is a growing segment of the marketplace. And all of these are zero emission vehicles, okay? They're here, they're growing over COVID. You've seen these, uh, these, these vehicles on the streets, more and more so. Uh, my colleagues, John uh, Rodman, I guess he's, he's online today, sent me a great article earlier this week. Did you know, little factoid, that the number one um, zero emission vehicle that's being sold today, it's not a Tesla, it's an e-bike, okay? E-bikes are outselling all e-cars, all e-anything. So it's out there in the world. Uh, the state of California now, starting in January, will be offering rebates for these bikes. So these bikes, okay, uh, are going to be very affordable, or relatively speaking, more affordable uh, come January. So you're going to see a, another bump in the market for these things. Uh, this, the federal government, actually, I believe, uh, in their infrastructure bill, is offering uh, tax credits for these as well. So these bikes are going to be in your neighborhood pretty soon if they're not already. Um, e-scooters, okay? Everyone thinks about birds and limes and, you know, these sort of rental scooters. Well, these things are available at Target right now or Costco, and I can tell you they were a hot ticket last year for the holidays. They're going to be another hot ticket this year as well. 
On the left are sort of this sort of universe of, of these kinds of vehicles. It's a long list. Um, they're out there. It's growing. It's the, the number and types of different brands are out there. They're probably on the cargo ships that are, uh, are parked outside the port of Long Beach right now. But they're here, and that's the growing market segment. That's the, the key point here. So how do we address this in terms of, 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 our, of getting around? Our, our streets are, were built for cars, okay? Um, and you know what served us, I suppose, well for, for decades, but as it stands right now, we've got some problems. And we've got some problems in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. We've got a lot of problems in terms of congestion. How can we rethink our, uh, our infrastructure? And that's what the COG has been working on for many years, and I've been part of that process, and so has Christian. And, and many of you uh, online have, have uh, sort of been sort of informed about this as we've been going along. Um, we took our research and we said, well, what, what can we do with our streets to make them, uh, to facilitate local trips? Um, you know, within cities, between cities, and in the sort of onslaught of, of new micromobility that's out there. The marketplace is growing into this. How can we rethink and reimagine our streets so that number one, it can improve safety, we can ease congestion if we can, and we can reduce air pollution and, and meet some sustainability goals. And we came up with this idea of a local travel network. It's been a couple of years in, in, in development right now. We worked through a Metro funded uh, a project to just take that concept and go, you know, and, and we got a consultant or two on board to say, how can we rethink these streets? They gave us a report. We went to Caltrans and they funded a two year project where we could reimagine our streets and actually refine our universe of streets to come up with a network. But I wanna be clear about this. This, is, this local travel network really is not about rentals or the dockless market. It's, it's not about, at this moment anyway, about reimagining uh, dedicated rights of way on our streets, protected bike lanes, all that good stuff. There's a place for that. And in the Netherlands and places where there's a huge biking community, that's a very successful way of if you build it, they will come and they will use it. Why? Because it's protected. And this isn't, it's not about road diets. So there's some political sensitivity that our organization has taken in terms of looking at how can we reimagine our infrastructure. What we're talking about here is personally owned micro mobility devices. You have a bike, maybe it's a pedal bike, maybe it's an e-bike. How can we rethink and reimagine our streets so you can ride safely in it? We want you to start thinking about a vehicle diet. Let's not get in our SUV. Let's get into something smaller, maybe a little more sustainable. It's something that will get us to and from our local destinations. So a vehicle diet is a new way of rethinking this whole idea. How can we share our existing infrastructure? So a local area, a local travel network. Well, we've been hard at work for the last couple of years taking the universe of streets, and I'll show you a map in just a second, which is about 2,000 miles here in the South Bay of neighborhood streets. These are uh, the streets that Christian referred to as you know, 25 mile an hour or less uh, streets. Uh, we created a 243 mile network um, of streets. We're not building new streets, we're just taking what's out there and, and reimagining them. Uh, and the idea here is to connect neighborhoods to neighborhoods to destinations, okay? Now, the bicycle infrastructure is somewhat like that. I think the intention, if you, if you ask Jim, he would say that's kind of one of the, the rationales for the, the, uh, the bicycle infrastructure. This takes it and sort of pushes that idea forward and really gets at the heart of what this infrastructure is designed to do. It's to get you around the South Bay so you can go to the bank, so you can get to the store, so you can go to the school or the park or wherever your local trips are. The key here is safety, and then Grace hit the nail right on the head, I'll echo the same thing. So our network, again, syncs up from neighborhood to neighborhood across busy streets or arterials, whatever those streets are, at signals, at traffic signals. There's problems at intersections, Grace mentioned those, but if you start there, you got to get to a signal. That's at least the first way of getting across safely. If you're in a, in a stop sign going across a busy street, well, Good luck. Um, outcomes are sometimes very uh, not very aren't satisfying at all. They're, they're dangerous. Um, and again, to get you uh, through efficient routes to and from your destinations. 
Um, and this is, you know, this network effectively is a shero system. Now, shero is, means share is, is, a, is a way of, of saying you share the road, okay? You're sharing the right of way. Um, so this is with cars and with other slow speed or micro mobility uh, vehicles. That's the primary infrastructure. That's the, that's the engineering that will go into this. And we'll get to that in just a second. There are places in the South Bay where that's just not going to work, okay, to connect cities to cities or within cities to get to different places. In that instance, we're talking about dedicated lanes. We call them local use vehicle lanes, love lanes. I think that's kind of a cool way of thinking about it. Um, and that's, a, that's another kind of design feature. But for tonight's exercise, I want to just focus on Sharos. So in a map way, okay, this is, the, this is what I was talking about. On the left are the green neighborhoods. Okay, these are all the slow speed uh, streets. And that's distilled over the course of two years. And I trust me, I, I either rode or I've bicycled almost all of this network. Okay, uh, sometimes in a slow speed in golf cart, sometimes in a car going very slowly, and a lot of it on a bike. Um, these are the streets we came up, up with. We call this a proposed network. We're not telling you these are the streets. This is what we came up with. There's a process that I'm going to get to in terms of a further refinement towards implementation. But this is where we start an engagement with folks like you in terms of, of did we get it right? Would you choose a different street? Uh, did, what about destinations? Did we miss something? But this is what we came up with over two years, and this is our baseline for further implementation going down the road. What does this look like in Redondo Beach? Um, I can come back to this. We can maybe have a working group somewhere down the road. But this is the map of the proposed local travel network in Redondo Beach. The purple lines, if you can see my cursor, let's see what I can get this thing working. Um, there it is. These purple lines have, uh, are the local travel network that we've that we propose. Okay, and the way this works, right? Again, is neighborhood to neighborhoods to destinations. Everyone, we believe, we start with the assumption, we think it, it, it's a good one, that you know your own neighborhood. So if I live in um, uh, a neighborhood here, I, I, I don't really need, I, I can figure out how to get to this local travel network. This is effectively a backbone, okay? There would be signs saying you're on the local travel network, and they would point to I'm going to go to downtown, or I'm going to go to Riviera Village, or this way to this school, or that school, or this place. Um, so the idea is you know your, your intuitively, you know your, uh, uh, your own neighborhood, you would get to the backbone, the local travel network, and you would travel to destinations. On the right are the destinations. Um, uh, these are what we came up with. Uh, arts and recreation, uh, that would be parks and such, um, schools, major employment centers, um, downtown districts, shopping centers and such. Our network effectively, we tried to sort of get the best possible outcome on the streets that are safe, slow speed, have signals for crossing busy intersections that would get you either directly to or close to these destinations. And again, we'll circle back on this uh, later. So what are what are Sharos? Um, I have many of you already know this, so I apologize if it's 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 redundant or uh, uh, just information you know. Um, but this is a Shero. The marking you see on the road here um, is a a sign, okay, to alert both bicyclists in this case, okay, and also motorists that you're sharing the road. It's directional. There's a, a pointing you in, in a direction. And again, you can see three folks riding different kinds of bicycles heading off to wherever they're going. Uh, here's a local example. I got this from uh, Hermosa, uh, Hermosa Beach. This is, I, I guess, on Monterey. And again, you see this in your community already. You have many, uh, many streets that are shared. Uh, this is a typical uh, example of what it looks like for bicycle infrastructure. Our proposal would push this even further to include um, NEVs or slow speed golf carts, okay? So you can imagine maybe, okay, it's not defined yet, this is something to be dis determined, but you could have a, 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 a multi-purpose lane or several lanes even, uh, that were maybe one for bikes, one for golf carts. Now you have to have a wide street to do that. Um, in all likelihood, this, this would, you know, there would be very few streets like this in the, in the South Bay. But you can imagine though that this, the, the Shero's markings on the road 
would be something that would say any of the bicycles, perhaps, um, in this for this local travel network. There would also be signage on the on the uh, on on the off the curb that will alert the, uh, the users of the network that the, they are actually on the local travel network. Imagining this graphically, uh, we had our consultant up for this project kind of look at what that might look like on a neighborhood street. So you can see the Shiro markings in here, parked cars. This might be a neighborhood electric vehicle. You would have bicyclists using it as well. Everyone is sharing these neighborhood streets. Now they're doing that already. We're just trying to bump it up so that everyone knows about it. So it becomes a, a, a piece of infrastructure uh, through education and experience that folks can use. You can imagine this for maybe a busier street. Again, you don't want to get much over 30 miles an hour, maybe 35 at most, but you could you can see how this might be built out. Sort of the green uh, uh, designated areas might be a, a wider bicycle lane. Again, functioning as a as a local travel network, share road st street or infrastructure. Moving forward, so the COG has been doing working on this for a while. We are trying to move with our cities and stakeholders like yourselves and others, the Bicycle Coalition, for instance, uh, towards implementation of this idea. Uh, and we are working right now, and we'll be soon starting a, a wayfinding and signage planning project. Um, uh, the idea again is you're going to need signs, you're going to need designations for the road. What will those look like? The COG is going to be investing its time and resources uh, towards that. Um, we have pushed out to the cities, the beach cities and inland cities, the idea of doing a pilot project for this. Uh, it's a, it could be a very huge project, which may not survive, but if maybe you bite off a smaller chunk and it's a demonstration, you might be able to proof test this, this concept. I'll show you what those, those corridors are. And again, it's outreach to uh, uh, stakeholders and champions much like yourselves. Um, so we have two uh, proposed corridors that we're, we'd like to bring online, uh, maybe sometime in 2022 and 23, working with the cities and then with stakeholders. This is the, what we're calling the beach corridor. It would be uh, uh, Manhattan Beach, uh, Hermosa Beach, and North Redondo Beach as potentially the corridor. It would be an inter. It would be within each city. Would be the local travel network, and then interconnections to other cities. So you want to go up to Manhattan Beach and have dinner. Well, maybe you ride your electric bikes up there. This would be a way of experiencing that on this network. Uh, similarly, we would do this inland, connecting Hawthorne, Lawndale, and Gardena as well. And again, this is about uh, community engagement, stakeholder engagement, uh, much like, again, tonight, city meetings, commission meetings. This is a long process. The roads are a valuable asset. People have a vested interest in this. I know just from the way Grace approached this and the way Jim will be speaking to you later, um, and Jim's been at this for decades. Uh, no one wants to give up the roads, okay? They need to see the value of something like this. And cities who are in charge of making these changes have to be engaged in this kind of process for change. Uh, the COG, working with cities in terms of providing capacity and, and understanding and, and expertise, um, are going to be engaged in all kinds of city meetings, commission meetings, community workshops, ride and drive events, educational forums, all those good things. We've even uh, created a tool. Uh, my colleague John Rodman did this. I would encourage you to go to our story map. I left it online uh, or in the chat. It's a, it's a link to uh, uh, what's called a, a story map. It's, it's a GIS tool. It's a great way to dive into this, learn a little bit more about these kinds of modes, about the network planning, the plan that went on to create this network. And there's even a survey in there that you can take and sort of give us your feedback. Um, but again, it's a, it's a way of engaging uh, community about this. So that's there. I also left uh, a report and a link to our report on our website. It's a rather lengthy one, several hundred pages. Uh, if you have nothing better to do, you can read it or you skip to the good parts. Um, but it's there too for your, uh, for your review. Some feedback sessions and the kinds of questions that we want to engage folks like you about would go something like this. Would you even want Shiro's in your neighborhood? This gets to the heart of it, right? Not in my backyard. 
the NIMBY issue. Um, would you oppose having a share on your, on your own street, maybe on another street that you don't, don't live on? These are kind of probing and important issues that we want to get to um, uh, about destinations. Is there some place that our network doesn't go that would be important? These, our network is just proposed. It's about, um, it's about finding the right streets, the right destinations, and making it make sense for the community at large. So that's my presentation. Um, I'm happy and available to answer questions, maybe when you're all done, Christian, um, uh, or certainly now. But, uh, but I, yield, I, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Great. If you would unshare your screen, uh, Aaron. Certainly. Let me do that right now. And uh, oh, great. Thank you. And, you know, I, I just want to talk about a couple things that were in Aaron's presentation before we go over to, to Jim Hannon. You know, uh, one thing he said that the, the local travel network as proposed is not, you know, it's it's not a road diet, right? And I want to make sure people understand what, what is road diet, because it's, it's a term that we've heard a lot in recent years, especially when, uh, when Council Member Mike Bonin and, and the City of Los Angeles uh, were trying to put um, bike lanes on uh, a section of Vista Del Mar. Uh, back behind the airport. And now I, I, the, the biggest problem there was that it happened in a little bit of a vacuum without a lot of public outreach. And so uh, especially commuters were shocked and there was a lot of pushback and they ended up stopping the project. And uh, and that's led to what I would say is a bit of stage fright in every city uh, in the South Bay as it relates to, um, to creating more uh, solid protected infrastructure uh, for cyclists, and in doing so, why they call it a road diet is, is because you're you're narrowing lanes and or removing vehicular lanes, and uh, and these are things we we really should be considering and talking about. But it's kind of become uh, it's kind of become the third rail where you know people don't want to talk about it. And we did have, and maybe Jim will talk about this in his comments. We did have a, a proposed uh, road diet for Prospect. Um, here in Redondo Beach, and that got shelved uh, very soon after um, after the Vista Del Mar situation. Um, but I think we know that uh, that if you build, and this is my opinion, I believe that if we build it, they will come. If you and Harbor Drive is uh, is a perfect example. Of, of this now it, it may not be the the I, I always thought the the protected bike lane should be on the other side of harbor drive when i was a harbor commissioner but uh but needless to say that bike path that connects to uh to both the esplanade and uh and the strand uh thousands and thousands of people use it uh throughout a week um, and, and they use it because it's, it's safe and, and effective and they are separated from, from the cars. And maybe aside from like a, a major event in the harbor, uh, there is really not a lot of car traffic down there. We, we, we do just fine with one lane going each way. Now, you know, one could say that that, that would change on other arterials. Um, but, but I think that these are things that we should consider because I think if people could get around, uh, in a way that they didn't need a vehicle all the time, they, they probably would. Um, there is a, uh, there was a tri-city study done between Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, and Redondo Beach related to Aviation Boulevard, which by the way, a lot of people commute from the three beach cities to get up to the aerospace industry or, or the Air Force Base. And there are a lot of cyclists that uh, that actually drive up uh, that way to go to work. Um, and uh, we had a tri-city meeting about this and uh, and a great presentation. And each of our cities were presented with a, a voluminous amount of, you know, uh, of reports on it. Uh, and we haven't done anything. We had a meeting about it uh, two and a half, three years ago, and, and nothing's come about. And so, uh, and th this is, I think, the biggest problem of all, and this is how I'm going to lead into introducing Jim here, because the South Bay Master Bicycle Plan is not a new idea, folks. Uh, Jim and the and the Bicycle Coalition and 
and uh, and many of the other uh, biking advocate groups were were pushing for this for years, and and it was finally enacted in 2011, at least here in Redondo Beach, and and Jim can maybe be more specific, but uh, all the other South Bay cities, I believe, also took similar action around then, and here we are 10 years later, and we still don't have. Uh, the South Bay Master Bicycle Plan effectuated throughout the South Bay. And that's a shame because in many cases, uh, a lot of these uh, streets that are identified in the plan don't, uh, were, were not actually specifically requiring protected lanes. They were requiring sharrows or uh, there's different class levels uh, of lanes. So maybe bicycle lanes that, that were not fully protected, but they were demarcated by a white line. Um, this is paint on street folks, you know, it's not a big deal. And, and it frustrates the hell out of me that we haven't been able to even do that here in Redondo, despite many, many conversations and me putting it into many, many budgets. So, uh, so anyways, with that said, let me turn it over to Jim, uh, to talk a little bit about the South Bay Master Bicycle Plan, which in many ways is the precursor to the LTN, but I don't think uh, we should consider that you can't have one without the other, or we should have both uh, in, in, in many ways, shapes, and forms. And so, Jim, why don't you uh, take it from here? Okay, thank you. It's a tough act to follow, I'll tell you, between Grace and Aaron. You guys both did such a great job. Um, I... I I, I don't have the maturity, the charts and things like that to put together, but I, I will share some things I think you'll find interesting. Uh, first of all, I, I guess I'm a um, 78-year-old senior, and I can't think of a, a particular time in my life that I didn't consider myself a cyclist. Uh, I've always been a cyclist uh, when I knew that I was going to retire after 45 years from uh, north of Grumman. I uh, decided that I would come up with a new chapter in my life and pursue cycling. So I became a USA cycling coach, level one. I became a league cycling instructor. I became a league cycling instructor for the League of American Bicyclists. I became a youth cycling instructor. Um, <clears throat> and besides the fact spending, I don't know, upwards of 5,000 miles of uh, a year on the roadways, uh, and observing what was going on out there. So I have some um, real experience to share with you. But anyway, um, to go back in time, enough about me. Uh, I, I don't want to restate what uh, Christian just said about the South Bay Bicycling Coalition. But in 2009, we did, in fact, this is a little bit like deja vu, actually, listening to Aaron because in 2009, we did, in fact, uh, have an opportunity to apply for a grant uh, through the L.A. County Health uh, Organization, and we were awarded that grant. Um, and we were also identified the reason we uh, were awarded that grant, because we were the first one in the nation to ever put together a multi-jurisdiction bicycle master plan. In other words, one that would take you uh, it connect to all the cities. It would actually take you places you want to go without finding uh, that at the end of this particular city at the border, uh, the bike lane would just disappear. So uh, anyway, we uh, received $240,000 in 2009. Uh, a group of us um, put together a series of workshops. We had 15 workshops. Uh, we invited uh, primarily um, people that were interested in commuting, running errands on a bike, you know, utilizing a bike, retaking a car off the road. Uh, so these types of people were invited to these workshops, and it naturally it was open to the public. We had maps in there. We would actually ask them to uh, put a dot where they live and put a, a line where they like to travel to, where they work at, where they go to school. Um, the data that was collected, we turned over to an Alta planning organization. Uh, they finally put together a bicycle master plan uh, that had uh, basically <clears throat> was introducing uh, 213 or 212 miles of new bike routes throughout the South, South Bay, all connected. And so we went out 
to city council members, um, city council meetings. Uh, we um, pitched our bicycle master plan, which is the first one uh, in the South Bay. Uh, we had a unanimous um, vote in favor of going forward with it. Uh, that was probably the peak of our success, by the way. <laughs> it may be short-lived, unfortunately, but uh, everybody seemed to embrace this. They could see that, uh, you know, we had to make room, respectful room for uh, people that uh, wanted to participate in active transportation. And um, so we basically uh, received uh, from every city council uh, unanimous approval of this to go forward with it. And in those days, before you were able to get funding uh, for infrastructure changes, you had to have a plan. And so the cities, each one of the cities benefited from this, of having this plan. That point on, uh, we started working with the cities and we did in fact make some progress. Uh, we certainly were able to get additional grants, funding, um, and, uh, and there was a churn in city council members, uh, other things that probably, you know, added a degree of complexity, uh, for us. And, uh, so the people that originally supported, suddenly we had new members of the city council, new mayors that had no recollection of this. And, uh, so in many cases, there was no forward action. But nevertheless, uh, we did not give up. We still haven't given up. Uh, we are still working with the cities. And one of the things that, you know, I, we do, um, we, uh, I'm going to share this. And I know it's an Excel spreadsheet, so it might be a little bit difficult to, to read, but I'll only share it for a few minutes. Um, I think everybody can see it. Well, this is Redondo Beach right here anyway. And this is our basic way, our bicycle master plan. And in Redondo Beach, we, um, <clears throat> we uh, got approved of 38.8 miles of new bike lanes. And this was class one, class two, class four. Um, out of that uh, 38.8 miles, uh, to date, we've got 3.5 miles completed. So uh, basically about 10% in 10 years. Pretty dismal. Um, so, you know, we looked at our approach and we, you know, we've got to make some changes. We've got to do something different than what we've done in the past. And recently, um, about a year and a half ago, we took a look at, during COVID period, uh, the bike master, the South Bay Bicycling Coalition and decided that we need to take a look at other coalitions. We need to see what they're doing. Um, you know, we need to learn from them. And so what we did is we have actually relabeled the, the South Bay Bicycling Coalition that we're now plus. And it wasn't just putting lipstick on the pig. We didn't see it that way anyway. But what we wanted to do is basically encompass all people that participate in active transportation. In other words, utilize our city streets to service anybody that uh, is a walker, runner, jogger, um, bicyclist, uh, rides an e-device, whatever it is. Uh, and we felt that was doable. We certainly attracted a much bigger audience as a result of this. And new attention, I think it's... Uh, uh, certainly the South Bay Bicycling Coalition Plus is certainly alive and well. And as one of the elements that we did, we, we knew that we had safety issues out there uh, in the South Bay. We, we didn't know how to quantify this. So about a year and a half ago, we started to work uh, with UCLA. Uh, there's a department there, Professor Paul Ong and uh, Paul and myself and some other people uh, decided we would put together a set of metrics that would show how safe our city streets are in the various cities. So um, with his oversight and uh, we felt that, you know, he brought a, a new level of credibility into this. Uh, we started to take a look at Swithers data. Those of you that it's probably a foreign word for sure, but 
This is data that basically it's a, a database that really is California wide and each municipality uh, is supposed to submit their crash rates into Swithers and that basically uh, is uh, goes to a validation period. Uh, it's reformatted by uh, Cal Berkeley um, and, um, and so they produce uh, a set of metrics that go out to the city and police departments, other city officials use these metrics to determine how safe their city is. So we took a look at Redondo Beach as well as all the other cities. Matter of fact, 15 incorporated cities in the South Bay and did some comparisons. And I think uh, you'll find this interesting because this was actually a letter that was sent to city council, uh, Bill Brand, mayor, and uh, as well as city manager. And what we attempted to do with this was not to necessarily throw mud in anybody's face, uh, it was strictly, we were strictly neutral in this. We basically used the city's data that was already submitted to this database. We formatted it in such a way that we could construct a report card. And it was with the idea that the city leaders, you know, would be able to look at this data, analyze it. Of course, you know, when you say that, you know, we've had X number of deaths in the city of Redondo Beach, you can't really do anything with that data. What you have to do is you have to drill into that data and find out what it really happened. And, um, and so that's what we are looking for the cities to do is we wanted them to take some, you probably can't read this very well and I apologize for that, but we basically wanted to, the cities to add um, a line item in their annual strategic plan uh, that would basically would be improve the, the safety of the public streets. We also uh, were deep believers in complete streets, livability projects, and certainly vision zero strategies, and we were hoping they might adapt this. As well as traffic common designs uh, implemented uh, and implement the bike master plan that was never completed. Um, report cards were uh, put out, we thought, um, very professional way. Uh, we actually <clears throat> uh, worked with an organization called SAFE in Los Angeles County, as well as Los Angeles County Bike Coalition. And Paul Ung uh, and Associates were the ones that validated the data. And they were kind of our 30, third party. So uh, we decided to put this um, in a format that that uh, we felt was easy for the cities to read. It was kind of an actionable uh, format that we, you know, could really highlight where the cities <clears throat> uh, basically uh, were rated in the way of a report card. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we, uh, we, we felt it was pretty good. And uh, we put it out about a year ago for the city of Redondo Beach and were, in this case, uh, we basically compared with 14 other cities. So this is a report card of Redondo Beach. And we really didn't know what to expect on this. We didn't realize that Redondo Beach was uh, basically the second to the highest, had the second to the highest bicycle collision rate in the entire South Bay. Now, this was a shock to us, I will tell you. We knew it was bad, but we didn't know it was this bad. We took a look at the pedestrian. It was the fifth highest pedestrian, pedestrian collision rate. So the next thing, you know, we wanted to drill into the data. We wanted to work with the cities, uh, much like they do in Los Angeles. And by the way, the reason that SAFE and Los Angeles County Bike Collision logos are on this is because they both loved what we did. And they decided that they would implement the same metrics uh, report cards across each one of the cities in Los Angeles County. So we actually started this not really knowing where it was going or what, you know, if we were going to get the desired results. But a year later, and we haven't gotten the desired results, we haven't, uh, we were kind of hoping that when maybe this would trigger an audience with, uh, uh, certainly the city managers, people like this, and we could share with uh, them a little bit more about the data, how we got it, what the breakdown was, and do a deep dive into the data. 
And of course, we ourselves did this, and we found that most of the uh, serious injuries were happening in inter intersections. I don't think there's any surprises. Uh, most of the serious accidents were happened where we had no infrastructure at all for the bicyclists. Um, that we were basically turning the, them out on the streets. And of course, you know, what we saw too was um, a lot of collisions. Um, and we started looking at the ages. The ages were significantly younger than what we originally thought. Um, we realized that looking at the data, there's also a lot of data behind this, by the way. This is a very top level overview, but we could look at the geographical locations of these accidents. We could see a lot of these were around the schools. We were not making the kids safe. Uh, you know, our commitment was through safe routes to school, was to give the kids a way to walk, to ride their bike, to be able to transfer out of their parents' car at the school safely. And, uh, you know, we did not do a very good job on this. It, it's, it's morbid. I don't know everybody likes to see this. We, uh, but, you know, it, we felt like if we don't look at this, we're never going to do anything. And so um, we tried to share this in the most positive way we possibly could. Um, and you can kind of see how we stack up. And these are all incorporated cities. The reason we didn't include unincorporated cities into this, because the data is not collected uh, the same way. And uh, what we discovered is the fact that uh, there was a lot of missing data in unincorporated cities. So our examples were we uh, we used were incorporated. And you can see for yourself on the pedestrian data where we fall. Now, I have other charts that were kind of normalized by the population. We know the city of Torrance is the gorilla in the South Bay. And certainly, you know, if you have a... Uh, a city that's almost three times the size of Redondo Beach, You're, you want, you would expect to see three times more uh, crashes. But that was not the case. This was raw data that was taken out of Swithers. Uh, and as you can see, Redondo Beach, as far as the, 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 far as the bicycling goes, uh, it, you know, it did show that Torrance, in fact, was... Uh, worse than Redondo Beach, but then when you looked at the population, you kind of understand that. And Redondo Beach was, you know, not as bad as Inglewood, and quite honestly, Inglewood, when you look at their infrastructure, it's very poor. So we have something going on. We suspect, we have a lot of suspicions. We have a lot of data. Uh, we feel that we want to put pressure on the city to be able to do something with this data. It is not Jim Hannon's data. Again, this is from the California statewide traffic recording system called Swithers. It's reported out of TIMS, which is a UC Berkeley uh, program that they use. Uh, these are the data rate ranges, um, and these are reported now. We know that uh, there's a lot of near misses out there. We know there's a lot of uh, accidents that do happen. Most of them, thank God, you know, people just get up and they put a Band-Aid on their shin and life goes on. But these are the ones that reported this This uh, uh, is a combination of uh, certainly fatal, severe, or maybe a loss of limb uh, visibility. In other words, there were little, uh, literally, um, things that were viewable that were, were serious enough to record, and then some complaints. Um, so I, I did feel that, you know, this should be shared. Uh, we've got a long ways to go, certainly um, putting together the Bike Master Plan. Uh, we certainly have a long ways to go with um, a safety, and uh, I've always, myself, being a coach, being an instructor, uh, I mean, safety is paramount to me. Uh, I see things out there, and I think we all do, uh, in the last couple of years especially, with the number of uh, bicycling, uh, bicyclists that have grown immensely. Um, matter of fact, we do a, an annual count uh, of, in certain areas we pick, and we have done this for about five years in a row, and we've seen two and 300% over the last year and a half in the number of cyclists. And we're ill-prepared to keep up with this. The city is not 
you know, had a program that we could do a little bit every year. Um, it's unless we do something different than we have in the past, we don't seem to be very successful at this. And I don't know, Aaron, now I know that, you know, we've got some new life and and, and, e-bikes and, of course, you know, e-carts and all the other devices that we're using to get around today. And we're going to see a lot more of that. I mean, when you see the e-bikes alone, we're seeing three and four hundred percent, you know, increase in sales in a one year period. The traditional bikes, we're seeing almost 200 percent. So it's not the same, but we're still seeing that cycling is alive and well. And uh, it is a good environmental thing to do. It's a healthy thing to do. And quite honestly, I've I, I got to speak in, about my own experiences. It brings me a lot of joy and my wife. And if I want to feel like I'm not 78, but I'm eight, I get on the bike. and I feel like I'm eight years old. So from a spiritual aspect, from a healthy aspect, from an environmental aspect, from a clean air aspect, I mean, we need to be able to accommodate people that want to participate in active transportation. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now, but... Uh, uh, I already did it for you, Jim. Oh, did you? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, a couple of the points that I, I did want to make, um, and then I'd be open for questions. Uh, I know that um, certainly, um, you know, Redondo Beach has always been a popular place to, to for the active population. Certainly, it's a popular place of biking, walking. It always has been. I've lived here for 42 years. And even if you don't count the number of visitors that, that enjoy Redondo Beach and come into our community, it is a very active community. Um, I think the, uh, T, the LTM project has merit and certainly has a positive impact on the impact, quality of air. I, I would certainly like to see more overlays. Uh, I think you can probably see by the infrastructure that you know, if you put a, a, a bicycle without an E device uh, on it, it works the same way in a class two bike lanes. Uh, you know, certainly we there's a, a, a lot of room for synergy in here. Um, I also feel that, you know, we really need to focus in on this if we want to save lives and, and continue, you know, making Redondo Beach. Uh, a community that's uh, full of active people. Um, we we need to do something about that, and uh, I'm hoping that this remodel that we've been doing on the South Bay Bicycling Coalition will help with that. Uh, but last but not least, um, you know, I mentioned my education background. Uh, certainly, um, I've been in, uh, a cycling instructor. I've uh, had many coaches for Leukemia and Foma Society, which is a fundraiser, uh, MS, uh, Best Buddies to help raise money for intellectually challenged people. So this is my second chapter in my life. Uh, and I, I know this is a three-legged stool, and I think Grace said that earlier about, you know, if we really want a safe infrastructure, we've got to design a safe infrastructure. We've got to build it with enforcement. I know that uh, education, uh, you know, it's another way to say enforcement, certainly by giving people a citation. Uh, that's one way to educate people, but it's not really the proper way to educate people. And uh, the SBBC in the last couple of years have piloted a program with the police of, in Redondo Beach that uh, we have created a, a bicycle diversion program which gives cyclists that receive a citation in Redondo Beach the same um, options if you were to receive a citation while driving your car. And that is, you can basically take a three-hour traffic school class in bicycle lane and, we, and, and actually eliminate the fine altogether and have it removed off your record. So we are doing a lot, um, not as much as we should be, 
Uh, certainly, we'd like to have more funding for this, but we're working with Metro uh, on their best education programs. We have our own adult bike education programs. We're working with the police department. Uh, we also, five, six years ago, we started a, sorry, um, a youth bike education program. We actually launched it in Redondo Beach um, in the third year, which was two years ago now, we suspended the, the program because of COVID. But three years ago, we had over 5,500 children complete our, our bicycle and pedestrian education program in elementary schools in Redondo, Hermosa, and Manhattan. So we're doing our as much as we can. But as you can see, and I think we've all observed, there's a lot of bad behavior out there. Whether you're driving a bicycle or driving a car, there's a lot of bad behavior out there. So we need to do, we need to do things better and differently than we have in the past. And now with the uh, new e-devices out there and uh, self-driving motorized vehicles like Teslas and things like that. It's a changing world out there for all of us, but we need to be prepared for it. We need to think about those things and not be caught with our pants down like we did with this last two or three year surge of, of new bicyclists and not have the infrastructure to accommodate that. It creates chaos on the road. It's certainly chaos for automobiles certainly chaos for and risk for bicyclists and pedestrians. Um, I'm, I'm available to answer any questions if you have anything. Great. Thanks, Thank Jim. Uh, Ron, you got your hand up. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So just so you have a little bit of my background, I've been riding my bike to school since I was a little kid. I had three bicycles. I have three bicycles at home now. I went to Davis where the whole community is all around bicycling and they've even done the 190th street challenge, um, climbing all the way up there. But the part that really got me is when my kids had to learn how to ride their bicycle, I did not feel comfortable taking him in Redondo beach to ride. We took him across 190th street into Torrance where the neighborhoods were a little bit safer and quieter. So if they wobble, they would at least be protected and just getting to there. We had to actually, I actually had to block traffic with my own bicycle because I figured I've been hit enough. So I know I at least know how to deal with that. Um, what I see is the three problems that you may want to address. Um, one is, I think you've alluded to the cars blow through the intersection. And I think I've mentioned it to you, Christian, it would be nice if we had people in the citizenry that could write down the license plate numbers of the cars that blow through it, transmit it to the police department and just get the police department to give them a courtesy letter saying you've been seen driving through this intersection, please slow down. Um, that could be one way of engaging the police and getting them to do something. Um, I think you can, Aaron can get his safe streets if we can encourage people to park in their garages. Um, some of the one-way streets, you really have to watch both sides of the streets as you're riding down the street. But if you've got at least one side of the one-way street parking in their garage, or at least limiting that number of spaces, you could actually safely, through most of the streets in North Redondo, get people to their destinations with it. Um, Christian knows I'm a, I'm a walker and I walk everywhere with regards to that. Um, but um, the other thing I, th I see that we're doing now, at least it's helpful, is street repairs. Um, that's also a dangerous thing when you are riding your bike on the street. There's some of the streets that are really in bad shape. And then the thing that bothers me the most, and Jim, this is something where the education comes in in the youth, I see a lot of kids riding without helmets. I see a lot of parents riding without helmets. I see the electric bicyclists doing it as well. And again, that's something where we can engage the police where they can, you know, pull somebody over and say, hey, you know, this is why you need to do it and bring your helmet to the police department so that we can see you have it. So I think we could make it a much safer community for our bicyclists, but 
I won't even uh, try riding on some of the sections of the community just because I feel it's really still pretty dangerous out there. And I used to ride my commute to work on Irvine Boulevard, which is a 55 mile an hour bike path. And it's, Redondo is much worse than that. So thank you for the work you guys are doing. I think it's great if we can get everybody up on, up to speed on that. Yeah, I, I, thank you, Ron. I really appreciate your comments, and I, I know they're valid. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And by the way, legislation uh, that uh, is being passed right now, in many cases, it's been passed reason, uh, recently about, you know, adding uh, cameras actually in school zones. Um, we just got word that that looks like that's going to pass, or it already did pass. Uh, there's another thing that interest may interest you is that there are, uh, there are, is a new diversion program now that's approved through the state of California for kids not wearing their helmets and then also maybe participating in some bad behavior that are under 18 where it requires them to actually, if, if the police wants want to go forward with implementing this program and they still haven't gotten a, a firm yes on it, but uh, we will basically treat that like a diversion program or traffic school for kids. So they will have to attend a two or three hour class with their parents, by the way, and uh, show that they do have a helmet, in fact, and uh, hopefully learn some better um, uh, ways to, um, you know, participate on the streets with, you know, less lawlessness, basically. So there are things that are happening in the legislation standpoint, which we're also uh, doing our best to support. So, but anyway, thank you, Ron. Yeah, I, I, Ron, I couldn't agree more. You know, we, we, the kids are only allowed, were, and have been, you know, allowed to ride their bikes on sidewalks, you know, and in some places we're not supposed to be riding bikes on sidewalks. So, uh, so, but I, I, it's funny to me because, you know, where I grew up, I rode a bike everywhere around town, you know, um, with, without really thinking about all these things that we're discussing here today. Um, granted, you know, our, our roads in town I grew up in were, were quite different than here. Um, you know, recently we had a, an item come to the city council about Manhattan Beach Boulevard. You know, we're going to be repaving it. And uh, we talked about putting in class four bike lanes, which are separated bike lanes. Um, not not class one, but uh, but similar, you know, in the sense that they can be separated with uh, with some type of uh, either striping or vertical displacement. Um, and the topic of parked cars came up and uh, a majority of the council members were not interested in taking away parking spaces, you know, and so you make a valid point, right? You know, a lot of our streets, somebody mentioned in the chat that a lot of our streets are narrow and they feel even more narrow when we have cars parked on both sides, especially here in North Redondo. And if we go back to Grace's presentation, she showed a picture of yeah, a telephone pole in the middle of the sidewalk, right? Um, we used to have to push our stroller in the street, you know, because the side, there's so many curb cuts and there's so many obstructions in the sidewalk, you can't get around. And that's why last October we had the, you know, how do we reimagine North Redondo, you know, this, this area that doesn't necessarily promote uh, pedestrian friendly or biking friendly environments, you know, how can we reimagine our streets and, and our areas uh, to, to accommodate that better quality of life. Aaron, from your perspective, uh, you know, Jim talked about the Master Bicycle Plan, and one of the things he mentioned uh, in there was, you know, the, the synergy, right? The Master Bicycle Plan, the, the LTN, even like Metro's proposed um, routes of getting people to, uh, to transit, right, to bus stops or whatnot. How, how do we really create a fully integrated system that the, the South Bay can then kind of use uh, to their benefit? You know, how can you use an LTN to get to a protected bike lane or, or vice versa? You know, the, these are the things I think that, that we do need to not just talk about, but we really, to Jim's point, need to finally implement. Oh, that's such a good question. How much time do you have? <laughs> um, uh, I, so the first thing I would say is more of what we're doing right now. I mean, this, can, this, this kind of conversation, and even what's in the, in the chat, is exactly the kind of forum and community investment that needs to take place before you even get 
to changing infrastructure. I I look at this holistically. Um, I you know not you know it's not one size fits all, but you know you're you're building to something. What is the goal here? It is a safer community where folks can can choose if they want and they will. It looks like uh, other alternatives besides getting in your car. Um, and, and so it's re it really is education, I guess, at the end of the day, uh, in, in various different forms and, and guises. Um, uh, I think the LTN can complement the existing bicycle infrastructure. I, you know, many of the routes we've taken are exactly over existing bicycle infrastructure. Um, you know, it would be restriping in, in, in the parlay of what we're trying to do. Um, I, there is proposed bicycle infrastructure that we we pointed at and said, well, look, it's not built, but maybe this is the catalyst to get it built. And now we're just going to make it a little bit wider, perhaps, and maybe put a different kind of sign up. Um, I, I think you know all you check box of box of all of the above. Um, and I guess at the end of the day, safety is paramount. Um, you know the studies have shown worldwide, and, and you pointed to it in your opening remarks. If you have a dedicated, protected bicycle, you call it, you know, slow speed infrastructure, okay, uh, people will use it and they'll use it year round and they'll even use it in the winter time. Uh, we don't have the problem of snow and nor do we have much rain at this point. But, um, but just looking down at, at the, you know, at King Harbor and, and sort of that sort of bike, you know, class four bike lane, you know, more of that, but that takes political will, it takes a heavy lift in terms of economics. And um, again, if you start looking back at the data and safety, uh, at some point things tip and people say enough is enough. I need to have a safe way of getting to and from school. So it's important for my kids to ride a bike instead of me taking them by car. So that's my take on it. I, I, I could go on I, a lot, a lot longer, but um, I, again, more of what we're doing now in, in, in this kind of community engagement. I, I think you hit on a, a really important point that we can, unless there's any other questions, uh, people can raise their hands, but that, that you know, we'll, we'll kind of end the meeting with. You're, you're absolutely right, Aaron. It requires political will. And, and you need uh, council members and leadership, and that includes city staff, that are willing to... Um, exercise judgment, you know, in a, in a very forward thinking perspective, you know, and I've always talked here a lot about thinking long term and long range. And, uh, and you need a body to kind of say, this is the right thing for us to do as a community. Uh, and, and then to bring the residents along and to talk about it like we're doing here. And this to me tonight, you know, is just the start of a conversation uh, and one that we probably should have had sooner. Um, because we need the residents to, I think, I think COVID presented us with a lot of opportunities to say, look, you know, people gravitated towards other choices, you know, during a time when they were able to slow down enough to think about it, right? To say, I'm going to get outside, I'm going to move around my community in a different way. And so we do need to push it and, and I will continue to advocate it in my, you know, final 16 months here. Uh, well, let's go to uh, Liam. I see Liam's got his hand up. Hi, uh, Eric. Um, appreciate the points made by everyone here. Um, I'm just curious, from your perspective, what the largest resistances are from moving forward with all of these great ideas about like dedicated rights of way and doing more of what we're doing down King Harbor and all that stuff. Like, how do we, like, you know, three miles every ten years is not going to keep up with the pace of that the rate that people are wanting to ride bikes buying new bikes and we really need to like you know jump on the exponential scale of scaling what we've what we've been doing and just curious how you think we can accelerate that and what the current obstacles are to pass that yeah so uh so i think the the first the first thing is uh political will having a, a unified council or councils in, in multiple cities that are, that are willing to to do it uh the second and then the second part of that as i mentioned in my previous comment was to really t 
talk about it, educate people about the why, the what, the how. Then, then we got to get into the funding, right, uh, perspective and how, how do cities effectuate that. You know, in some cases, like doing Sharrows or, or Class 2 or 3 bike lanes, you know, that just requires paint on the streets. That's not really a big deal. Um, uh, but, but if we're going to build Class 1 or Class 4 lanes, uh, you know, those require engineering studies of roads and, and uh uh, and, and then, of course, you know, build out, right? Uh, and so we can use uh, Measure M monies through Metro to do a lot of this uh, type of uh, work. And, and not only this, but like Jim mentioned, complete streets, you know, so like rethinking like Artesia Boulevard, something I've been, you know, passionate about. How does Artesia Boulevard become a complete street where it is both pedestrian, cyclist, and, and vehicle friendly? You know, how do we have wider sidewalks with outside dining? How do we create an environment, a lived environment that draws people? people in, right? It's something very different than just a, an arterial where cars are just passing through, if you will. Um, I think, uh, then beyond that, I think there's one other step that we do need to consider. And, and, and part of it, uh, I'll go back to the comments I made earlier about, um, Assemblywoman, uh, uh, Friedman's bill, right? As it related to, uh, to, uh, traffic speeds, right, and and cities' abilities to be able to lower speeds um, without being handcuffed by state state rules. Um, I think we need to have a bit more flexibility in in the way traffic engineers uh, are looking at what can they do with a street. And so, and this is not in any way meant to uh, to be a ding towards you know our public works. Uh, individuals and our traffic engineer, but a lot of times they, they're they're kind of looking at what are they allowed to do and what are the guidelines and and uh, so like I'll, I'll just use as an example one of the uh, conversations I've had is why don't we put the bike lanes on the inside and put parked cars on the outside to act as a uh, a natural barrier to to a bike lane right um, and they will give you a list of reasons why. Well, a bike lane has to be X amount of feet wide, right? According to, you know, the, the guidelines. And then, you know, you have to have X amount of space between, between that and between where the parked car is. And now, and then you start to get into how it's going to limit the, the vehicular lanes as it is. So I think we've got to, and, and this is me speaking as a lay person because I am not an engineer, um, but, uh, but I think we need to be creative, a little bit more creative about how do we effectuate change, you know, and what can we do? Because at some point in the past, or, and I don't know how they're doing, they do it in Europe, but I don't think people are overthinking how to create new infrastructure, uh, in, in certain places. I, I, I think, you know, a lot of times we, we set guidelines and rules and there may be very good reason that we do that. And, uh, but, but maybe not, you know, and how can we be more creative to effectuate change that, to your point, we need sooner than later. And, and to the point that Aaron and Grace were really making in their presentations, not only do we need it sooner than later because of the explosion in people that are cycling or buying e-bikes, right? We need it actually because uh, from a climate change perspective and, you know, we're we're really going off the edge of the cliff here in Thelma and Louise style. You know, we really need a way to uh, to dramatically reduce greenhouse gases in a very short period of time uh, to to hopefully offset some of the the changes that have already happened. So uh, I know that that's a, a a big answer there, but I think those are the the steps that we should be doing. And I think what we need, and Jim and I have had this conversation many times. We need more advocacy to a council. I think uh, city councils are hesitant to to make changes like that because, sure enough, if you talk about taking away parking spaces or talking about vehicular lanes, people will scream. Uh, and uh, most most council people I know in any city uh, are very hesitant to tick people off that are yelling at them. Uh, so, in many ways, people who are advocates for change. Um, need to be just as vocal and need to be coming and presenting. And so, you know, a lot of the documents that Jim presented tonight, you know, uh, were because he's, he's trying to be more vocal. And, and so, 
uh, that that would be my 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 piece of advice. You know, we're not going to see change unless people are really asking for it. Um, and you know, I can do my best, but I'm only one vote out of five, uh, and you need a majority. And I will close tonight by going back to what I said. I truly believe that uh, if we build it, the people will use it, and and we will figure out ways to to adapt. Uh, to those changes. I think just one of our, our biggest issues here, and it's not just in, in the scope of this conversation, but any conversation, it's, it's the fear of change. And when we, when we hear about something new, uh, could be development, could be business, could be, you know, whatever. Uh, it's not what we're used to. It's not what we're comfortable with. It may be stretching us uh, in terms of what we are comfortable with. Uh, but you know, one thing I find is that when, when change does happen, people adapt. We are a, an adaptable people. And, uh, and, and a lot of times, people who hated the idea of something end up loving it when it's fully executed. And that is, is really, that's the hard thing. You know, I've, I've, I, you know, maybe what we need to do, whether it's for development or for changing the way our streets work, is to uh, is to put people into a virtual reality moment where they can ex have an experiential uh, viewpoint of what it could look like. Because when you see drawings, you know, or models, th those just don't really do it. And uh, and when you can put yourself into an environment and see it, you know, and and um, really have that that vibrant experience, I think that's when people start to change their minds and go, huh, this isn't as bad as I thought it would be. So uh, I think we, we should continue this conversation down the line here in some way, shape, or form, because tonight was a lot to unpack. And, uh, and I, uh, everybody had to rush through you know, their presentations, but I want to thank uh, Grace and uh, Aaron and Jim and uh, and let's all continue to uh, to try to reimagine what what our city and our South Bay can be in terms of uh, getting around. So, uh, with that said, we will end our November community meeting on that note. Thank you, everyone, uh, for for being here, and uh, have a very happy and safe Thanksgiving. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. Take care. Bye, everyone.